Hello, my name is Murray Roberts, and I'm the coordinator of the Atlas and I Atlantic projects at the University of Edinburgh. And in today's presentation, I would like to show you a little bit about these projects and to walk you through the way that we built them, some of the results that the projects um, have achieved, and just reflect a little bit on how projects of this type uh, can be developed to really enhance how we manage and understand deep ocean ecosystems at the basin scale. So to start us off, I'd like to talk about a fundamental parameter uh, that many of us you know, know something about and many of people at this conference know a lot about, but it's the overturning circulation um, of the oceans. This one connected ocean space that is connected through this global circulation pattern. If we look here, we can see that circulation pattern as it relates to the Atlantic with the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic drift currents, bringing warm waters across, keeping Europe, Northern Europe, much milder than it otherwise would have been. That heat released to the air, of course, does that, modulates the climate across Northern Europe. As that water cools, it becomes denser, it sinks, it overturns, and the countercurrents flow south. Now, as that's happening, of course, that warmer water is interacting with the atmosphere, the extra carbon dioxide, the extra heat in the atmosphere is transferred to the ocean into those areas of deep water formation around the world. Now this process, the overturning circulation, is fundamental to, to the design of our projects at basin scale, both Atlas and Atlantic. So I want to begin by walking you through what was the Atlas project, a project that finished in 2020 after over four years of an intense work in the North Atlantic. Both Atlas and I Atlantic are projects that are funded through Euro European Union uh, Horizon 2020 uh, contracts. These are European projects, but they've allowed us to work seamlessly with partners in North America and now in partners throughout the South Atlantic. But in the case of the North Atlantic projects, the funds remained in Europe. We needed to form partnerships with American universities, with Canadian research organizations. We might share people, we might share equipment, we couldn't share money. But it didn't stop us doing an amazing amount of work. Atlas was built across a series of case studies in the North Atlantic. Those of you with good eyes can see the small case study sites and do check the website for more details. We looked at a variety of ecosystems. I'll show you some in a second. But we built our science plan very much alongside the international physical oceanographic community that run OSNAP, AR7, the Extended Ellet Line, and the Rapid Climate Change Array uh, that spans the Atlantic. We added to the capacities of these arrays. We put, for instance, nutrient samplers in the rock old trough to look at, um, to make much more biologically relevant measurements from the existing physical arrays. Um, the consortium. Uh, included 24 partners, the linked third party in European Project Speak is Department of Fisheries and Oceans in, in Canada, they joined us to all intents and purposes as a full partner but through a different contractual uh, arrangement. We had over 70 researchers, 10 PhD students, we ran over 20 workshops, but one of the aspects I'm most proud of is how many research expeditions Atlas brought together, either running them from the project itself or by partnering with other expeditions. 45 expeditions were completed. 120 papers were written during the course of the project. About the same number are now in preparation. There were 90 in preparation when we ended the project. We also achieved a media reach estimated at something like 600 million people. Another aspect that I'm, I'm really excited about and proud about is that at our first meeting in Edinburgh, we brought together people from across the North Atlantic Noah, from that meeting and from those discussions, developed what we now see as Aspire, Atlantic Seabed Partnerships for International Research and Exploration, a really lovely legacy of that first meeting of the Atlas project. I mentioned the sorts of ecosystems. Um, these in Atlas were all benthic systems, seabed ecosystems, those dominated by deep water corals, the reefs and carbonate mound systems. We looked at seamount systems and coral gardens. We had a major focus on sponge grounds, and we also worked on chemosynthetic systems. Indeed, Atlas researchers discovered a, a new vent system off the Azores, the Luso vent field was discovered and described through Atlas research cruises. In parallel with Atlas and over the same time period, the European Sponges uh, project was running coordinated from Bergen. Do check the Sponges website and, and information for information on deep sponges. 
We also worked on sponges in the Atlas project and had a number of collaborations uh, with, our, with our friends in the sponges project. What was Atlas doing? Well, here are the objectives up on the screen. And I think you can see, I won't read them all out, but you can see as I speak, really what Atlas was there to do was to better understand deep Atlantic ecosystems. So these are the most poorly understood ecosystems in the Atlantic. We made that argument, we needed to understand them better, aware that human activity was increasingly moving into deeper waters. So in essence, Atlas was about doing the very best science and translating that to industrial uh, stakeholders and policy makers. So we had a very active science policy and industrial aspect to our project. We wanted to see how well we could gather the information, collate the information, and then use that through the lens of maritime spatial planning to inform sustainable management in the future. In a talk of 15 minutes, I can't give you even a fraction of our results, but do look at this compendium of resources and results that we prepared at the end of the project. It's available on the Atlas website. What I can do is tell you how we did it and give you a few highlights. So Atlas, was a scientific project, absolutely, but to give us the impact and to make the connections we needed, our advisory board drew from industry, uh, from particularly the offshore energy industry, very active in, in deep water settings around the Atlantic Basin, and the blue biotechnology um, sector, which is, of course, rapidly developing, has continued to do so uh, when Atlas finished. Um, huge thanks to everyone who was involved in that advisory board. We also interfaced through the policy work package led by David Johnson with the regional fishery management organizations of the North Atlantic and through the processes that would get Atlas science to our FMOs and to nation states around the Atlantic. ICES was particularly important in that regard. As an EU project, as a European Commission project, we kept the EC informed at all stages of our work. And finally, I'll, I'll give you some examples of how we interfaced with the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction negotiations that are now ongoing at the UN. Atlas was indeed present at the preparatory committees. We ran a number of side events, the Global Ocean Forum and others at those events. I'll also give you some examples of work we did the Convention on Biological Diversity. Now this slide summarizes Atlas in a very simple way. And as you look at the different components of the Atlas project, it's really important to understand that the project only worked because we put equal emphasis on all aspects. We didn't overfocus on the science to the detriment of our socioeconomic analyses or to the detriment of the work we were doing in policy or the work we were doing to engage citizens in understanding and exploring and enjoying the deep Atlantic Ocean. So this multidisciplinary approach was at, at the very heart of everything we did. We had to figure out how people around the basin value deep sea ecosystems. Really nice work from Claire Armstrong and her team in our socioeconomic work package. We used that and all of our natural science information to inform spatial planning and then brought that information to the science policy interface. And we did all of that in the duration of a four year research project. So some examples of the kinds of results only a very few today because time is so limited. Ocean circulation, as I've said, was a foundation to our work, understanding how the overturning circulation is, is, is now and how it has been in the past to inform how it may change in the future or our understanding of how it may change in the future. David Thornalli in his Nature paper uh, described through Atlas work how the AMOC is anomalously weak. And for 150 years, it's been weak. This was work based on traditional paleo uh, analysis of foraminiferal and, and sortable silt size accumulations. So please do look at this, this paper to understand in detail what David and his team have put forward. Work that was backed up with other high profile publications at around the same time. Um, in terms of other areas of the project, we've looked at many aspects of the biodiversity of the deep Atlantic, both to census what is there now, and in the case of Marato et al in global change biology, to try to understand how that biodiversity may change in the future by focusing on habitats like the deep corals that are engineering species that provide habitat to so many other species. This is not a happy paper. This paper is showing the dramatic decline in habitat suitability across the North Atlantic, both for a range of deep corals and the change in distribution patterns we'll be seeing for a number of commercially important fish species. In terms of communication and outreach and engagement, really proud of the work that Dynamic Earth and Aquity T pulled together, uh, with, which has substantial legacy. 
The online resources, for instance, from, from this work were picked up at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic by school teachers right across Europe and elsewhere who needed online resources as they moved to online teaching very in a very, very short order. Another legacy of the project will be a completely new gallery at Dynamic Earth Centre here in Edinburgh, where we'll be looking from the early days of the Challenger expedition, which celebrates its 150th anniversary this, uh, uh, this year and early next year, and looking forward to that development, um, which concludes with the present day and how ocean sciences now explore the deep ocean. So a really nice legacy of the project. In terms of the impacts that we had in a, in a policy arena, I'll give you a couple of examples, but for details, please see this report uh, on the policy implications of the Atlas project. And the examples uh, that have trailed already are work at the BBNJ negotiations, which culminated in a paper that was looking at the conflict of consensus around how science is used or is perceived to be used in those negotiations. A really interesting piece of work that's led to a, now a four year follow up study. We also work strongly with the Conventional Biological Diversity, particularly by submitting information to the Northeast Atlantic EBSA's workshop, Ecologically or Biologically Significant Marine Areas workshop. You can see the case studies uh, that we submitted information to, but number four on Tropic Seamount was actually entirely developed within the Atlas project. The companion paper is on the screen, led by Berta Ramiro Sanchez. And as a result of that, the Tropic Seamount moves forward as a potential episode for final ratification alongside the other Northeast Atlantic areas. So a really, really nice legacy of the project there. So I want to leave Atlas um, at this point and use my last few minutes to just introduce where we're moving forward. It's quite unusual uh, and I'm really lucky to be in a position to have gone from coordinating a North Atlantic project with a year of overlap now to a full Atlantic project, I Atlantic. Here we're looking at an integrated assessment of Atlantic marine ecosystems in space and time. Now, I should give you the background. ATLAS was mandated through the Galway Statement on Atlantic Cooperation, signed in 2013. Um, and I Atlantic is mandated through the Bell M Statement, signed in 2017 um, between South Africa, the European Union, and Brazil. And why in the middle do I put this figure from IOC's Global Ocean Science Report? Well, it came out in 2017. It includes, to me, one of the most shocking figures in any such report that illustrates the disparity in capacities to understand the Atlantic and the, indeed the oceans of the world. It's a cartogram that is skewed at the top by numbers of publications and at the bottom by the numbers of citations received. The world should not look like this. We should have an equally balanced expertise. And iAtlantic has an opportunity to contribute here because we have the funds and resources to work seamlessly across the Atlantic Ocean with partners from North and South, East and West, all working together in one integrated manner. And this is the power of that international partnership. We're studying uh, a series of Atlantic time series across the entire basin. We're working across all sectors. We are building capacities and sharing expertise. That isn't just as simple as, let's say, technology from the North Atlantic moving to the South, or our work to supplement the monitoring capacities in the South Atlantic with new equipment. It's also using the best of the expertise, for instance, in Central and South America on marine taxonomy to inform researchers in Europe and the USA. So it's very much a multi-way sharing of expertise, and that's critical to our approach. Looking at the project um, summary, you can see a roll call of organizations on this slide that are involved in iAtlantic, from the very largest marine science organizations through to some of the very smallest, including citizen scientists from Bermuda who work on, on humpback whale migration. So we have over 170 staff in the project. We have almost 50 early career iAtlantic fellows in the project and a webinar series I'll talk about in a second and capacity building program. It's that capacity building program I hope you can engage with, those of you that hear this talk, be in touch with us if you want to come to an event or you want to offer something to the capacity building program, we'd love to hear from you. It's a large project with a budget of over 10.6 million, uh, but from that we've leveraged something like three times uh, the investment in offshore research expeditions. 35 people, or sorry, 35 organizations draw funds from this project and we have 11 associated partners. A few more examples of that power of, of international partnership. 
Atlantic has already delivered 40 offshore expeditions. We have nine more schedules, 39 papers published and 22 workshops and webinars. We don't just focus on seabed ecosystems. In Atlantic, we're also looking at a number of fisheries data sets, a number of major uh, humpback whale migration patterns and movements through the Atlantic. Do see the website, please, for more information on what it is we're actually doing and the approaches that we're actually taking. I don't have time, sadly, today to, to go into very many details. What I can do, though, is share with you some of the links where you can find a lot of extra information. In fact, those of you that teach in universities, do consider using the webinar archive of over 20 talks now on topics from time series analysis, through policy development, deep sea mining, marine heat waves, and many, many others. There's a tremendous resource there from real leaders in their fields and the early career scientists who are at the cutting edge of developing new approaches to understand Atlantic marine ecosystems. So thank you very much uh, for listening to my talk today. I really appreciate it a lot. And here are the links and, uh, to our various channels, to the website, and our latest newsletter came out in January. Thank you very much.